Once we were underwater, INA Director Claude Dutuis kept in touch by means of our wireless communication system. From Carolyn, we might for the next few hours watch excavators clean around an Inakawi or remove an Olpe and carry it gently to a waiting lifting basket for safe transportation up to Virazon. Or we might see the discovery of a large plate and observe its excavator, remove it from the sand and carry it off the wreck, past the telephone booth to a waiting container or see another excavator cleaning around a bowl. When they hear the timekeeper signal to come up, each team puts its fins back on. They have worked without fins to avoid stirring up sediment. Then they swim up to the decompression stop where they change to breathing pure oxygen while they decompress. At last, Carolyn ascends and returns to Milawanda to be winched up to deck level. It was an especially exciting day when we raised the ship's stone anchor stock. For inside Carolyn was a special visitor, Dr. Malcolm Weiner, founder of the Institute for Aegean Prehistory, which funded INA's purchase of the submersible. Five of INA's most experienced divers were on the wreck. Robin Piercy and Tufan Tarana attached a lifting balloon to the stock and filled it with air to buoy the heavy stone as they began its trip to the surface. Murat Tilev held the floodlights for Don Fry to record the operation on video, and Sheila Matthews covered it all with still digital photographs. When the stock broke the surface, archaeology student Orkan Koyaseolu detached the balloon from the stone so that the stock could be winched onto Virazan's deck, where it was examined by Fea Subai, already up and out of Carolyn. Later in the day, after our little fleet sailed back to port, Tufan, Taranla, and others had the hardest job. Without a lifting balloon, they had to carry the stock ashore and load it into the bed of a pickup truck to be taken to our laboratory. By far, the most important discovery of the 2002 campaign was part of the ship's hull, where just as INA has for the first time traced the slow evolution from ancient to modern ship construction, now it would have the opportunity to show for the first time how archaic Greek shipwrights built their vessels. The first of two planks, each over two meters long, appeared downslope at the deepest part of the site. This is where Fred Van Dornick, after studying our site plans, accurately predicted we should find part of the ship's bow. Even before the plank was raised, we realized its importance. The plank was not held to its neighboring plank by mortise and tenon joints, as on the Ullaburun shipwreck of around 1300 BC and on the Kyrenia shipwreck of around 300 BC. Instead, the planks were laced together, the bindings running through triangular holes and pegged tight. Ceramics also need desalinization. The field work for 2002 ended with our loading intact artifacts onto a pickup truck, checking their inventory numbers, and then unloading them at the Bodrum Museum of Underwater Archaeology. A human chain took them up the castle steps to the large freshwater tanks near the conservation laboratory. <laughs> 